This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com, and in this talk I wanted to talk about Denise D'Souza. I don't know how many of our readers are familiar with this individual, but he's the author of some best-selling books, quote, New York Times bestsellers, about God and religion and Christianity, and he claims to be Catholic, and he's gotten a lot of publicity in creationist circles and even on the mainstream media he's been featured on television programs and so forth because he debates the prominent atheists who attack religion such as Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and he basically tries to meet their atheistic arguments against God and against Christianity on an intellectual level and so forth but the reality is the man is an evolutionist falsely posing as a believer and it's quite deceptive because for those who might not know better they might think well he's debating the atheist he's attacking atheism therefore he believes in the Bible he believes in creation and so forth and he's maybe got some reliable information in that area and the truth is just the opposite first m what people need to realize is that the man is a believer in evolution he believes in macro evolution Yet at the same time, he, in his book, What's So Great About Christianity, another, quote, New York Times bestseller, frequently brings up the, quote, shortcomings of evolution. And of course, evolution, as any traditional Catholic who has the faith knows, is a complete hoax. It's refuted by all real science, but it's believed by basically everyone in the, quote, academic community, or at least those who are advanced to positions at almost all colleges and universities. And so on the one hand, he will criticize the, quote, shortcomings of evolution to make it seem like, you know, he's not agreeing with it, and that appeals to the creation audience. But then, a few pages earlier or a few pages later, he'll tell you that he believes in evolution, it's compatible with the Bible, and that there's no reason for anyone to reject it, and that those who reject it on biblical grounds are being rash and not really analyzing the evidence or what people really should know about the Bible. For example, in his book, What's So Great About Christianity, on page 151, he says, quote, evolution remains the best and most persuasive account of our origins. It is impossible to deny the theory's explanatory power, end quote. And he goes on and on in this area about how he believes that evolution has been strongly proved. And I can't spend a lot of time refuting his false scientific arguments or directing people to those who have in depth detail refuted them. But we sell the book by Walt Brown in the beginning, which destroys all of the evolutionist arguments, addresses all of their false claims. And I want to quickly refute one that Denise D'Souza brings up. On page 150, he says, quote, One of the strongest proofs for evolution is that the geological record for all of its imperfection shows a single invariant trajectory. The oldest rocks contain only single-celled creatures. Later strata show the appearance of invertebrates. Then we see the first fish, then amphibians, then reptiles, and finally mammals. Man appears latest on the scene. The fossils are found in exactly the places and at exactly the times that we would expect if Darwin's theory is correct. Not a single fossil has ever been found in a place where it is not supposed to show up. Until this happens, and I don't think it will, evolution remains the best and most persuasive account of our origins. End quote. Well, obviously, Dinesh D'Souza doesn't know too much about this issue, and he's been reading the propaganda of the atheistic evolutionists rather than creationist works which address and blow this false claim out of the water, and in the process refute evolution according to his own argument. For if he says if you find examples of out-of-place fossils, it would refute Darwin's theory. In his book, in the beginning, Dr. Walt Brown summarizes some of the examples of out-of-place fossils on page 11. He says, quote, frequently fossils are not vertically sequenced in the assumed evolutionary order. For example, in Uzbekistan, 86 consecutive hoof prints or horses were found in rocks dating back to the dinosaurs. Dinosaur and human-like footprints have been found together in Turkmenia and in Arizona. Sometimes land animals, flying animals, and marine animals are fossilized side by side in the same rock. Dinosaur, whale, elephant, horse, and many other fossils, plus crude human tools, have reportedly been found in phosphate beds in South Carolina. A leading authority on the Grand Canyon even published photographs of horse-like hoof prints visible in rocks that, according to the theory of evolution, 
predate hoofed animals by more than 100 million years. Other hoof prints are alongside 1,000 dinosaur footprints in Virginia. And he goes on and on and on. I mean, there are just tons of examples which completely refute his false claim. Brother Michael also covers some points on the fossil record in his video, Creation of Miracles Past and Present, which is on our website. And so what I want to point out is how wicked this is. This guy is like a Trojan horse, and not that he's that well known but by traditional Catholics, but he's you know featured on television and in some circles where creationists might expect him to be somewhat reliable on some of these issues, and he's sort of insinuating himself into creationist circles with this garbage. Now, I want to point out some of the devilish contradictions in his book. As I said, he likes to bring up the shortcomings, so he's trying to have it both ways, that basically evolution isn't a great explanation, but I believe in evolution. And I believe part of the reason that he is inclined to accept macroevolution, the absurd myth, is because if he did not, it would vastly cut down his audience. He wouldn't be on television, certainly not as much. He would be ostracized from the pseudo intellectual academic community which accepts evolution as dogma and so basically it's very convenient for him to uh, not condemn evolution it he would drastically cut off his audience another thing that I wanted to mention a little bit later is that he this guy claims to be Catholic actually and some of the heresies he puts into his book are just incredible and so he's not remotely a true Catholic but in the area of page 149 he's arguing how you know numerous evolutionists are quote Christian you know, trying to instill the compatibility of the two. And on page 156 and 70, he quotes a physicist who tries to explain basically how God created everything and then set evolution into motion. And it says, quote, For one kind of life to evolve into another may be attributed to the blind forces of nature, but the anthropic principle implies that these forces were set in motion deliberately, purposefully, with a view to producing precisely the living beings that biologists superficially presume to have gotten here by accident." End quote. So he's quoting this physicist who says that evolution does explain things and that it operates according to the quote, blind forces of nature, but that it is set in motion deliberately and purposefully by God. And this is a contradiction. He's trying to reconcile two opposed principles. And to further illustrate that, I will quote his own arguments that he makes. For instance, on page 152, he's arguing for the complexity of the genetic code. And he quotes someone to show that the genetic code is digital in exactly the same sense as computer codes. And he comments that each DNA molecule is an algorithm in biochemical code. And he quotes another author who says that the cell displays levels of regularity and complexity that exceed by orders of magnitude anything found in the non-living world. End quote. So he's making these arguments from a designer, from the incredible complexity of life, the design we find in DNA, the design and the complexity we find in the cell on this page. But just a few pages later, telling us that we and all living creatures are the result of the blind forces of nature. And this doesn't make any sense. For why would God, who so finely tuned the creation, as he argues in one place, and with such amazing specificity designed our genetic code, then allow the bodies of all living things to come about through a process of trial and error millions of years of suffering, failure, the blind forces of nature, etc. It's completely incompatible with the argument that he so carefully crafted and constructed the cell and the DNA molecule. It's a contradiction. And if you can't see it, then you're just steeped in spiritual blindness. And so another point I wanted to make is that while this individual is in one way very learned, he knows a lot about history, uh, philosophy, etc., he's actually, his arguments are actually stupid. And so while he's respected as a great academic, he actually misses the simple points, and his argument is horrible. And that is what intellectual pride can do. Not only can it liberalize a person, but it can cause people, and always does basically, cause people to miss the simple 
big points. And so while they fancy themselves sophisticated and intelligent and learned, they actually become stupid. And so what we have in this book, and in the next part I want to talk about quickly how theistic evolution is not compatible with the Bible, some of his other liberal and heretical statements.